Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tower podcast here in March. Wow, my goodness, where did January and February go? Excited to be back here for part two of a conversation that super close to my soul these days. And uh, my son Blaine is with me. Last week, if you didn't pick that up, we were beginning to talk about how do you live at the end of the age? How do you live in a time that is, first off, a brutal time to be a human being and all of that that I've been introducing for months now? God cares about our humanity and maturity and wholeheartedness are simply not an option anymore. This is a very difficult hour. How do you live in this hour? And as I had introduced last time, I was asking Jesus that question, how do I live in such an odd time as this? And he said, by expecting the wonderful. Mm. And I, oh my goodness, yes, yes, yes. Because without that, it's just the long march. It's just the one foot in front of another, keep going, the next mission, the next crisis, the next meal, right? Yeah. It is the difference between Apocalypse Now and C.S. Lewis's comments on The Lord of the Rings, where the Apocalypse Now Vietnam movie is meaningless. It's conflict, 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 the famous line, someday this war will be over, but not really, versus Lewis commenting on the characters in The Lord of the Rings say, theirs is the affliction of people who were happy before a certain darkness came and will be happy again when they live to see it gone. Yes. Yeah. I'm so different. This age will cause you to slip into the first, it will cause you to slip into the nihilism if you are not expecting the wonderful. And we want to riff a little bit more on that. I think the first thing I want to say, or the first category I want to raise this week is the nature of hope. C.S. Lewis said, you can only hope for what you desire. Scripture says, Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope, which is an anchor for the soul. Peterson translates it as a spiritual lifeline reaching right into the presence of God. And that hope is expecting the wonderful. But I just want to point out, you don't drop an anchor in jello. You don't weigh anchor in nothing. Like You can't drop an anchor in a vacuum and have it hold you, right, against the storms of this world that are trying to sweep you out. Yes, it's, it's the extremely common experience of showing up in a new place and going, I had no idea it would look like this. But we know that we expect in terms of experiences we've had. And fortunately, I've been to Hawaii, and it's amazing. And before I went, I really did picture T Street Beach in Southern California. Yeah. And explicit or not, we are doing that, which is just to say, you are only expecting in terms of concrete pictures that you hold. If you don't hold them, you're populating it with some other really fuzzy thing, which is why people who show up in beautiful mountains are shocked that they're in beautiful mountains and not in the Flint Hills. And yeah. you go, well, did you spend any time establishing expectations? Any and- time even imagining it? Yes. Yeah. So back to the conversation last week, I was mentioning a conversation that I was having with a beautiful saint, woman of God, lived with him for decades and decades. And This was only one example of, I could name hundreds of conversations like this, but this is a recent one. She is losing friends. She is at the age where many of her colleagues and college roommates and that sort of thing are passing on. And so we were having a conversation about what is the wonderful that we are expecting. And that file folder for her was so empty. And she would say things like, well, who really knows? I'm like, you are a follower of Christ. How can you say that? That's so impoverished. But then she did get a little desire, and she said, you know, I really hope that I get some time with Jesus. I'm like, what? 
Well, you know, like to be able to have a conversation with him. Ooh, it was heartbreaking. I couldn't believe this was coming out of her mouth. I'm like, what? You don't believe, understand, hope, expect, have wonderful images of you getting time with your Savior and Lord, your best friend, the one you have served for 50 years? He didn't have time for you. He's not going to be the very first person to greet you. Like, wow. It's that kind of poverty that I think actually is the majority of Christians' experience. It's that kind of poverty. Wow, we don't really know. Gosh, I hope it'll be good. You know, will we all be with Jesus as a group, like millions of people, or will I get any time with him? It says, hope does not disappoint. Mm. And What I want to say is, yes, it does. It disappoints all the time. Whose experience are you talking about? Recognize we have a poverty of images around expectation. We actually have a poverty of expectation itself because of the effect of disappointment over time. Mm -hmm. We think that disappointment is something we have to get used to, not a violent tactic that the enemy uses to actually erode a key capacity of our humanity, which is to hope for things and expect them to be realized. And so, you know, I want to throw the table because I go, how can you have no pictures? The Bible is full of pictures all the time. The parables of Jesus are full of pictures. Do I get time with them? People freak out in the book of Revelation because the dwelling place of God is with man, you know? If Jesus said, I'm going to move into your neighborhood, I would think we're going to grill together. We're going to smoke cigars in the evening. Right. And yet, our capacity to hope in things has been so destroyed that we are surprised when magazines that we subscribed to show up in the mail. (laughs) Right? Or, you know, we were just at an event and I was wearing a hat for Anson's, the young men's magazine we do. And the guy liked it, and I said, oh, I'll grab you one. And the next day, I see him, and I hand him a hat. And he was shocked, could not believe that it was actually happening. Yeah. And so there's the tragedy there, too, of go, yes. oh, well, not only do you have no pictures, we aren't very able to actually believe that the pictures are going to come true. Yeah, so we turn to our current addictions, by the way. Like, yeah. if you do not have this kind of hope, But I'm thinking about backpacking trips that Craig and I took back late 70s, early 80s. And we would do these epic trips in the Sierras. And it was five passes in five days. I mean, it was serious elevation gain and loss. You are hammered and exhausted. And you're living on dried fruit and nuts. You know, backpacking food back in that day was not like it is now. Like there are delicious meals now, but it was not great. And so you are looking forward to the meal that you know is waiting for you when we get back down in Bishop, California, out of the Sierras, and we're going to go chow down, right? We're going to get burgers, fries, milkshakes. And the idea of like a strawberry milkshake when you're five days into a backpacking trip is the most exotic, wonderful thing in the world. And those kind of carry you through, like there's hope in your heart taking these boots off, dipping my feet in the stream, you know, sitting in a van to go home and not having to propel myself any longer, right? Yes. Cars, when you get done with a backpacking trip, cars are the most amazing thing in the world. They're like magic carpets. They are. And the wonderful thing about this experience is that when you take someone backpacking for the first time, There is a kind of expectation that builds among the veterans while you are nearing the end of the trip. Just wait. You're going to get in the car. But on the way out, there's this river that we all stop at and we strip down and we jump in. And were that not enough, after that, there's this place and you can get a steak and it costs $6. And we go in and it's plates of French fries. And there's just so much anticipation built into, again, concrete images and experiences and things that you have come to expect over time where I remember a hard day of yard work 
the first few times round, those as a teenager are a real bummer. But later in your 20s, when you know that a Negro Modelo on the patio step is coming in the evening and what it will feel like, yeah. have a very different experience of the heat of the middle of the day than... Yeah. So Stacy was packing for a trip recently, and she was getting so much joy out of preparing and thinking about it and looking at pictures of, oh, where are we going and what are we doing? And she was just commenting on anticipating it has been vacation enough. Just the days and the actually weeks of thinking about it, making lists, putting little things away. Oh, I need to bring my earplugs. I need to bring my swimming goggles and, you know, the joy of that, the joy of expectation. So let me read from Romans 8, 22. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. And then he kind of gives a parenthetical comment. He says, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we wait patiently and confidently. So much to unpack in there, but what you and I were riffing on after last recording was that idea of the ability to wait patiently, but hopefully, hopeful waiting, hopeful expectation has been so eroded in the human heart, so eroded in the human soul by an age of instant gratification, by an age of, you know, I do my banking from my phone, I order my groceries from my phone. You don't need to go to the grocery store anymore. They'll just bring them to your house. You know, we get takeout food and, you know, Starbucks drive up and everything is instant gratification. The human soul has literally, it's been stripped of its ability to wait for anything. One. One, okay. Next piece. We have been so repeatedly disappointed and have not stewarded it well. Mm -hmm. When we come up on the holidays, my wife and I have to have a conversation where I go, this is a world at war. It would be wise of us to hope for more than one thing. And as a spiritual practice to go, I would love a beautiful Christmas morning. I don't have to have it. What I actually want is some experience of the love and presence of God. Yeah. And he can do that anywhere this month. Yes. Very few people do this. And it's very easy for Christmas morning to be disappointing. Yeah. Right. Putting all of your eggs in one basket is not a wise wartime practice. Right. And to go, I'm so sorry for what the enemy has taken away from you. Not only can you not wait for anything. But the things that you were hoping for get taken away so often, it has an effect over time that needs to be cared for, or you just go, well, you got to get used to disappointment. You are built for satisfaction in the restoration pictures in the book of Isaiah. Working and feasting are always coupled. They will build houses and live in them. Yeah. They will plant vineyards and drink wine in season. Wow, how do you care for the sabotage of fruitfulness as it relates to our need to yes. be desiring beings? Yeah. Yeah. So, friends, we're just opening up the category of the nature of hope and how hope and expectation have been so eroded in our experience, eroded because of the moment of time we live in, eroded because of all kinds of personal disappointment, and by the way, I think this is one of the good uses of Lent. We're in Lent right now, and many Protestants have begun to practice Lent as sort of recovering a spiritual tradition. I think one of the best uses of it is going without something for 40 days simply so you can look forward to having it again. Yes. Just 
that one exercise. I remember the very first Lent I practiced, you know, 30 years ago now. And I gave up wine. And over the course of Lent, there were the moments of, oh, we're out to dinner, but nope, nope, because I'm practicing a spiritual discipline. I'm going without to build in myself, first off, the ability to wait for anything. <laughs> and secondly, to cultivate this idea of something wonderful is coming. I remember getting home on Easter morning after church and we had a big feast in the afternoon and people over for dinner and we opened some bottles of wine to go with the meal and it was so happy. It was, it was like, yay, now I get that thing that I've gone without and I've done it with chocolate and I've done it with television and I've done it with self-reproach and uh, re-indulging self-reproach is not joyful, but whatever it is you choose to fast from, this is one of the dimensions of fasting that I've actually been thinking about, writing about for Anson's recently, going, we fast and then sort of accuse God of being ascetic or not being invested in our pleasure. But I'll have these funny conversations where I'll fast from something and then something in my heart will go like, see, you are sort of withholding. And Jesus will respond, you've just lost the ability to enjoy it. It speaks to that seal of the promise. The Holy Spirit is the signet ring given to you by the Lord of the estate to show that you are the heir. So the loss of the Holy Spirit should concern you if it's part of what gives you eternity. But unpacking it more, our ability to enjoy things just declines over time without yeah. any attention. Yeah, And so... I love the Lent example to go, one of the reasons we take breaks from anything is to acknowledge that we get used to stuff and then forget how awesome God is. And taking a break from eating breakfasts for a week and all of a sudden... Breakfast is the most amazing all thing. All of a sudden you're like, my <laughs> life is so full of the generosity of God. Look at this breakfast. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And now on the backpacking trips, like we get so used to cars and then you get back into a car and you realize... <gasps> This is the most amazing thing. I can't believe we get to just float down the road here. So here we are in part two of a series on how do you live at the end of the age? And there's a number of things that we would say around it. But one of them is by expecting the wonderful, by cultivating your hope again. And the nature of hope is you can't hope for something you don't desire. First off, you can't be vague. Hope doesn't work with vagueness. If I were to say, hey, Blaine, I've got this most awesome thing. In six weeks, you are going to inherit a blubbly blub. And you would go, that's not helpful to me. What is a blubbly blub? And I go, well, I can't really tell you, but it's a blubbly blub. Would that arouse hope and expectation? Oh, no, no. And it's worse than inherit because this is the thing that we are not losing heart in view of. And so it's, come work for me at the day, and at the end of the day, I will pay you. What? With something. And go, <laughs> okay, you know? Yeah. If if I'm going to bust my butt yeah. on your estate, yeah. I need to know if you are the kind of person who passes out a fiver at the end of the day, or if you are the kind of employer who goes... Here's 50 bucks. And by the way, here's a six pack of beers to drink when you get home. And by the way, is it like here's that? Here's dinner out. Yeah, here's all that. Okay, so friends, hope works like this. You can't hope for anything you don't desire. You know, I have uh, another friend, lovely woman, who loves the city. And her joy would be to be given a month in Paris. I don't love the city. I've been to Paris. It was nice. But... If you were to say to me, hey, your reward, John, is to spend eternity in the city, I would go, oh, thank you, right? If you don't desire it, you won't hope for it, gang. You can't drop the anchor of the soul in something completely vague, void, vacuum, empty. So if your file folder here on expecting the wonderful is basically empty, you have no anchor of the soul. You have none, because that's the nature of hope. And Jesus was so committed to this that most of the time when he talked about hope and expectation, he tried to make it as concrete as he possibly could. 
finally rising from the dead himself and appearing to his friends, Thomas, here are my wounds, touch my hands. Like it's real. He was so committed to making it real. Yes. So if it's not real and concrete and substantive, you can't hope for it. You can't expect the wonderful. So what I want to riff on a little bit now and turn the corner back to, that's why we ended last time with Blaine's narrative on the coronation of Jesus, just to begin to imagine things, friends. Imagine what you will do when heaven and earth are one. Imagine what you will do when all things are made new. Imagine what you will do in the restoration. Dallas Willard tried to push hard on this when he said, you should be making plans for what you will do with your unending life. And so I began to do that. So here's one of the things I'm looking forward to. This may strike people as funny, but I need an education. I need an education. I love learning, but I actually got kicked out of high school. I had a 4.0, but I got kicked out of high school because I wouldn't go to class. And then the rest of my life has just felt like this hobnob kind of cobbling together in education, went to grad school, you know, eventually went back, got my GED, went to undergrad, went to grad school, but life's busy, life's full. You don't do all your reading. I don't know what the Pythagorean theorem is. I don't know much actually about the Battle of Thermopylae. I know nothing about the Chinese dynasties. I don't know a thing about physics, not a thing, let alone the physics of miracles, right? What are the physics of heaven? What is the physics of the kingdom of God? Like, I, I am a very uneducated man. Let me connect this for a moment. I was reading a fascinating article on our obsession with technology and smartphones and that sort of thing and what it's doing to us. And the writer, Nicholas Carr, a Wall Street Journal article, uh, he also wrote the wonderful book, The Shallows. He says, as strange as it might seem, people's knowledge and understanding may actually dwindle as gadgets grant them easier access to online data. In a seminal 2011 study published in Science, a team of researchers led by Columbia University psychologist Betsy Sparrow and the late Harvard memory expert Daniel Wegner had a group of volunteers read 40 brief factual statements, such as the space shuttle Columbia disintegrated during reentry over Texas in February 2003, and then typed the statements into a computer. Half the people were told that the machine would save what they typed. Half were told that the statements would be immediately erased. Do you know where this is going? Yes, I do. Okay. Where's, where are we going? What do you expect? Well, who's going to remember exactly. anything? Who's going to remember anything? The people who think it's going to be saved for them by their digital device don't bother remembering things. The people who know it's going to be erased immediately remember it. Now, here's the fascinating thing is that the story has a twist. It turns out we're not very good at distinguishing the knowledge we keep in our heads from the information we find in our phones or on our computers. And he goes on to talk about mental capacity. We're actually getting dumber in the technological age. And here is the fascinating twist the novelist and critic Cynthia Orzik wrote. Data is memory without history. Her observation points to the problem with allowing smartphones to commandeer our brains. When we constrict our capacity for reasoning and recall or transfer those skills to a gadget, we sacrifice our ability to turn information into knowledge. We get the data but lose the meaning. This is so fascinating is that in order to be an educated person, like truly educated, you actually have to have that stuff in your brain. You have to have it in your soul. And I am a very uneducated person. I'm so looking forward to learning. Aren't you? I am. This, this is a riff, you know, you and I had in, in a drive recently. But one of my favorite questions here is, what are the problems you can't wait to solve with all of the resources of heaven and no evil. Are you a physicist? Then you know full well how difficult the potential colonization of other planets would be. Wouldn't it be incredible to work on that with a team with Kepler and Pascal <laughs> exactly. and get these minds around a table and 
Yeah. God is the God of process. He's Go not- to lunch with Einstein and ask him a few questions. Hey, we're trying to work on this thing, which is that, you know, even with immortality, it's very hard to get out of our galaxy, you know, because of temporal paradoxes that happen when things are spinning and go, big problem. It's going to take a long time to solve that one. Or I'm not a physicist. There is a long list of writers that I'm looking forward to. I have projects that I'm working on right now. And if I haven't finished them, when I die or Jesus comes back, I'm going to keep working on them in the kingdom. Exactly. But I'm going to sit in a pub with C.S. Lewis and talk character. And how does he open someone when he's having a hard time? Mm. And what does Charles Williams do when he's stuck? And, you know, if, if the trajectory of his plays is any evidence, we have some reason to hope that Shakespeare will, in fact, be in the kingdom. One, can't wait to find out who he is. Two, can't wait for the kinds of questions right? that we could talk through or together. Or just to sit around over a pint and crack jokes. Just, oh my gosh. It will be such a ball. Like, friends, you, you begin to fill this place in your soul with concrete, real expectations of like learning languages. I am embarrassed that I know one language. I am so looking forward to learning other languages because the scripture is very clear. Every tribe and tongue and nation is there. Heaven is not the great memory wipe. The coming kingdom is not the great obliteration of all that. The distinctives will be celebrated, right? What were those statues doing on Easter Island? What was that about? All these fun and fascinating things. Yes, that will be challenging is the other thing too. And go... Hey, here's a random one that I think is interesting. So, an average of one new dinosaur is discovered a week. I think that's amazing. But I would go, wow, dinosaurs. (laughs) Right. I honestly, I have a few (laughs) theories that are mostly fun rather than theologically robust about extinct creatures in the kingdom. Yes. But I know they will play a role. But I go, what kid does not love dinosaurs and think they're fascinating and want to see one and we know as with so many things so little i kind of thought until learning that that most dinosaurs had been discovered and we went hey during this period of earth's history here were the animals but to go oh we have no idea every week we're finding something new i mean honestly we can't really there is no definitive hypothesis on how dinosaurs reproduced that's interesting i would love To see a T-Rex, or in fact, you know, most dinosaurs actually lived in the ocean. And how do you rule dinosaurs on a restored Earth? And what is their role? Yeah. We're off into a a highly narrative-driven land, but I just go, that would be fascinating. Yes, totally. So I want to make this crystal clear before we bring episode two in for a landing. I am looking for, searching for, and things are coming to me unexpectedly that are giving my heart and my mind concrete, real expectations of the wonderful, ways to expect the wonderful. And we told the story last week of losing one of our horses, losing Blaine's horse in the fall, and it was absolutely tragic and totally heartbreaking, and I still can hardly bear to go to the stables to take care of our other horse now that's all by himself. I was reading through the horse and his boy again really over the holidays and up until now, just relishing pieces of it. And there's the part where Shasta saves Anvard. He he makes it across the desert with Erevis and the two horses there with, Huyn and Bree. And then he's separated from them for a while because Erevis stays with the hermit and the horses do, convalescing while Shasta has to go on to save Anvard. He does and actually discovers that he is the king of Arkenland's son, and his name is not Shasta, but Kor, and so he comes back to Erevis and the hermit as Kor, and there's this wonderful dialogue where Erevis apologizes to him because she's been such a snob, and talk about the prophecy over his life when he was a baby that he would save Arkenland from her greatest threat, And then they have this wonderful thing where he invites her to come and stay in Anvard, and she says, of course, I'd love to come. And and then he says, now let's go and see the horses. There was a great and joyous meeting between Bree and Kor 
because they had ridden together so much across the story and they'd shared all those months of adventure. I burst into tears reading that last night. I just started weeping like, oh, to be restored to the horses that we've lost. And we've lost more than one over the years. Like just that, like just that concrete thing of, oh, I'll get to see them again. And my heart responded immediately with just tears, tears of sorrow and tears of incredible gratitude. Yes. A low barrier of entry. Find the song The River from The Mission Film Score by Ennio Morricone, The River, The Mission, and play it while picturing literally any restoration that you can think of or would anticipate and... It is a track that captures the mm. feeling of the forest returning in the wake of the Waldo Canyon fire here in Colorado, yes. or of first seeing one departed friend, and then another, and then another. Yes. And then it's less like reunions, more like the start of a party, and you yes. realize guests are arriving, and yes. somebody runs for a ball of wine, and yeah. it captures that. Last week when you were reading... The processional, one of the lines I love so much is that you could run laughing into any set of open arms. And that happens at the end of the latest Star Wars movie. The Rise of Skywalker. The Rise of Skywalker and the celebration at the end of evil overthrown and they're reunited together. And you can't hug people fast enough. Yes. Everyone is just running around trying to get in as many reunion hellos as they can and the laughter and the glad tears of that like that scene will do it for you go see rise of skywalker and and linger on the last scene and just let that fill you with the anticipation of that's happening yes that's yours yes. another great picture of the coming kingdom it comes at the end of the novel leaf anger peace like a river i love peace like a river great novel and the protagonist at the end of the story is in, he's having a vision of, but he's in the kingdom. And here's the description. I waded ashore with measureless relief. The bank was an even slope of waving knee-high grasses, and I came up into them and turned to look back. It was a wide river, mistakable for a lake or even an ocean, unless you'd been wading and knew its current. Near the shore, the water appeared gold as your favorite river at sunup. But farther out, it turned to sky and cobalt, and finally, a kind of night in which the opposite shore lay hidden. The meadow hummed as though thick with the nests of waking creatures, and the grasses were canyon-colored, lifting their heads as I passed. Moving up from the river, the humming began to swell. It was magnetic, a sound uncurling into song and light and even a scent which was like earth, and I must have then entered the region of nests for up, scattered finches and cheeky longspurs and every sort of bunting and bobbling and piebald tanager. All these rows with sweet chaotic calls whirling and resettling to the grass. More placid, butterflies clung everywhere to stems. Some you would know, the monarchs and tailed lunas, but others of such spread and hue as to have long disappeared from the gardens of the world. The meadow was layered with flight. In fact, it seemed there was nothing that couldn't take wing. Seized with conviction, I spread my arms and ran for it. Nope, no lift off, but I came close. At times, my feet were only brushing the ground. But I was drawn on, conscious now that something needed doing. Mm. Friends, the only way you can live in an hour like ours is expecting the wonderful. What is the wonderful you are expecting? Your soul actually should be filled with hundreds of these kinds of images and expectations. I've begun to journal mine and write them down so I can go back and reread them. I'm looking for them in the ends of books and novels and movies and stories and even childhood memories of going, I get to go back there. I get to fish there again, expecting the wonderful. This was part two of a multi-part series, John and Blaine Eldridge here. But before we sign off, I did want to let you know about one thing. I am going to be beginning a Facebook Live book study 
Conversationally, we can interact together on Facebook Live, and you can send questions in, and we'll dialogue on that. And that will be 6 p.m. Mountain Time on Tuesday, March 10th. So March 10th, we're going to begin a four-week book study on Get Your Life Back. So if you haven't gotten your book and begun to get your life back, you're going to want to do that because it's healing and wonderful. And then we'll be able to dialogue on it and ask questions and, and back and forth, which we've done in previous books and it has been really, really rich. So March 10th, Facebook Live, a beginning of a four-week conversation back and forth on that. Really hope you enjoy today's podcast.